Uh, for those of you that haven't had an opportunity to do a session with me just yet, my name is Trista and I'm um, working within the Office of Student Financial Services. And we wanted to offer an opportunity to think about what's coming up over break from the context of, you know, being prepared and budgeting for it, right? Um, one of the really unique things about budgeting is it's a forever type of thing, right? We don't do it once and then we're never doing it again. So the concepts that we talk about today will first be fundamental. Uh, and then from there, showing how we can apply it to some of the things that we might experience as we're preparing for that winter break period. Now, um, as we go through this process, right, we want to make sure we're thinking about our dimensions of well-being. And I always like to start with what financial wellness really is, okay? When we talk about financial wellness, you know, we think about our other types of, uh, the other dimensions in the wellness realm, right? Our spiritual, emotional, intellectual. A lot of these are a little more obvious than financial might be. That sounds very, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, statistical, a little cold, right? However, our finances are really tightly played into so many other areas within the realm of wellness, certainly we can think about stress as an example, right? Uh, finances can be a source of stress, or they can be a source of joy, depending on the circumstances, right? And those things ultimately play into some of the other areas that uh, we have in the dimensions of wellness. So what is financial wellness then, right? How do we make that bridge? Uh, if we look to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, they suggest that financial well-being can be defined as a state of being where you have control over your day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month finances. Uh, you have the capacity to absorb a financial shock. You're on track to meet your financial goals, and you have the financial freedom to make the choices that allow you to enjoy life. Um, so that sounds a little grand, right? Um, but at the same time, it sounds like wellness. So it perfectly makes sense that we should be thinking about these two things together within those dimensions. So how do we get to financial wellness? Uh, that's where financial literacy comes in, okay? Um, financial literacy is what I like to call the path to financial wellness. It's a set of skills that encompasses knowing when and how to find reliable information to make financial decisions, and then knowing how to process that financial information to make sound financial decisions, not just make a decision, <laughs> and knowing how to execute your financial decisions, being able to adapt is necessary to stay on track. Um, now, if you take the two in parallel, right, we think about uh, the wellness side of it, that's having, 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 um, where the literacy is knowing, 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 right? We have action steps and we have results. So one of the key components of financial literacy then is to put your skills into action. Otherwise, they're just skills. They don't really help if we're not using them. Um, and that's ultimately where some of the material we'll talk about today comes in. It's to help you put these things into action. Now, one of the resources we have here at the university is called iGrad. Um, I'm not sure that anybody's familiar with it. If you are, fantastic. Um, if not, I'm going to share what it is. Uh, it's a free financial literacy platform that's offered um, via the web, uh, and it's available to all Columbia students um, for free now and after you leave school. So anything that you do within the platform, if you find something ultimately that you like having access to, you'll be able to utilize it now as well as after you leave. Um, you'll ultimately create your account using your at columbia.edu email address and you'll be all set to go. And some of what you'll find in there are different um, articles. There's coursework in there um, that has pre and post assessments, which is really cool. Um, and there's a wide array of topics that fall within the financial literacy conversation. Some of the more obvious ones being that we're students, of course, we'll see stuff for student aid as well as student loans. Uh, there's scholarship information, but all the way on the other side, we have consumer information as well, right? Um, ultimately, anybody that deals with finances is likely a consumer in some way. So there's information about kind of common consumer products like uh, personal insurance, home and auto loans, um, health insurance, for example. And then, of course, those things like retirement planning and savings and being able to prepare to use credit and manage debt responsibly. So all of the information that's in this particular presentation, the vast majority comes from iGrad. So if I can know it, you can know it. And I strongly encourage you to go in and create your account. And we'll show you some of the tools that are available today to help support your budgeting needs and the winter break needs that you have. So here's our fundamental introduction, right? What is budgeting? Um, very simply, it's the balancing of your expenses and income. Makes sense, right? Um, better yet, a lot of us like to think of it as a plan. It's the process of creating a plan to spend your money. So instead of just thinking about it in this kind of static context of today, we want to take that conversation into tomorrow. And we do that in five steps. Uh, the first is understanding needs and wants, um, and then knowing our income and expenses, right? They're both very important. Uh, how we can start to set goals with that information 
information, and then how we transition to that future process, making our spending plan. And then, of course, being able to assess and reflect on that particular plan, right? We talked about the need to adapt in that financial literacy and wellness conversation. That's what assessing and adjusting does. Now, if this is something that's relatively new for you and you're looking to get a little bit more information after the session today, um, one of the really nice features, those courses that are available in iGrad has a couple of different places and opportunities to expand on your knowledge related to budgeting. And one of those is actually listed here on the screen. Um, and as we go through this, uh, you'll see links at the bottom of the pages here as well. Uh, you'll have a copy of this to be sent out after the session. So you can link directly to the things we talk about today too. We'll talk a little bit more about the courses in a moment. Now the next step, fundamental, and this is going to be a big part in the conversation that we have today, knowing what's important to you, right? We can't manage to get through our finances unless we can determine what we want and need to prioritize, and that's a very individual conversation. It relies on things like our values, our beliefs, our attitudes, and then ultimately how those things create behaviors, how we actually react in situations. One is never independent of the other. The reason we do what we do is largely because of who we fundamentally are. So we have to keep that in the conversation when we're talking about needs and wants. Um, with that being said, um, on the more kind of general side of that definition, needs are very simply basic things that are necessary for survival. However, survival is a relative term. Um, survival could be your literal physiological needs, right? Or survival could be being able to make it through your day to day without feeling taxed and emotionally drained. It really just depends on where you are. Um, so that's why it's going to be different for each person and different for you now and 10 years in the future. And 10 years ago, we're all different people at some point. Now, wants, on the other hand, very simply are those things we desire to make our lives more satisfying, right? Still relative based on the way we determine needs. However, if we ultimately decide something is a want, that tells us we don't need it today. That's the core fundamental difference between the two, right? And if we don't need it today, we can plan for it tomorrow. Um, and that'll be some of what we chat through today as well. Now, if you have a hard time really thinking through that conversation of needs versus wants, because again, it's relative. And even if we think about it just sitting by ourselves in a room, it really depends on how we feel on a given day or what the particular goal that we're trying to achieve is. There's some really fantastic tools available to you through iGrad um, to help you better understand the why of your finances. My favorite of which is their Your Money Personality Assessment. And you're seeing some screenshots on, of that particular assessment on the screen. Um, basically, it's about a couple of questions um, in a quiz that you take, and none of them are really finance related. Uh, and after answering those couple of questions, you get about a 40 page booklet about how you may see your personality influence your finances. And it's not just a book that says, ah, this isn't right. We need to be doing things differently. That's not the point of the book. It's meant for you to be able to reflect on. They talk a little bit about how you engage with your money and how that your, your personality could be a contributor to it. So for example, this is actually a snapshot of my book. <laughs> um, I got the feedback that an emotional perspective, I'm a bit relaxed and that's very true. I'm very much a go with the flow kind of person. Um, and what the book ultimately gives you is three challenges that you may have as a result of that type of personality, um, as well as some of the strengths that you'll have as well, right? Um, for example, I got the feedback that I could potentially be, you know, very comfortable with going into uh, opportunities that might seem a little risky, right? Whether it's bungee jumping or maybe an investment opportunity. I'm not terribly risk averse. So that can be a positive. But on the other side of that, right, that kind of go with the flow personality could also be challenging, right? Right? I could tend to be very easily influenced um, and a little impulsive. And both of those are very true. I'm one of those people that the end cap on an aisle is a very interesting place to hang out. And if I think I want something, I'm probably going to go try and get it. <laughs> now, ultimately, I can use an example here during the pandemic to see how I put some of the recommendations I have into practice. One of them was, because I'm a little impulsive, slow down, take a beat before you buy, right? Um, that's actually something I've struggled with in this environment. I started to notice the, uh, the brown boxes being delivered and then ultimately being put out to the curb a little more frequently than I'd like. And uh, <laughs> the faces of the gentlemen that do the recycling for me, <laughs> I was a little, you know, I thought, okay, well, if I'm worried about them seeing the number of boxes, I'm doing something wrong. So how do I stop this? Um, I needed to think about me. How do I engage with this circumstance? Well, if I can put something in the cart online and buy it and have it in two days, that probably 
probably tells me I don't need it right now. So if I can wait two days, I can wait four days, right? Um, by doing that, that gives me a chance to step away from it. Um, if it maybe was just an emotional purchase, not really have to be too concerned right away about it and you know jump into making that purchase. But instead, if I go back in two days and see that I, one, don't remember why I put it in there, um, or two, found a way to solve my problem without it, I can take it out of the cart. And I haven't actually spent any money to do that. So it's just an idea that came from this very simple uh, set of information out of this book, but at the same time, you can apply it directly to your day to day and how you work within your finances. Now the next piece, know your income and expenses. Okay. Um, ultimately what you're seeing here on the screen is a tool that's available through iGrad. It's their daily income and expense diary. Okay. And what this allows you to do is track over a period of time, how much money's coming in, how much money is going out day by day by day over a 30 day period. So about a month. Okay. Um, there's different areas that you'll be tracking if you use this particular tool, like your housing expenses, uh, those fun expenses that we all have, like going out to dinner, things like that, um, your savings, investing, all the different areas you're seeing here. And then as you go through and track that information, it ultimately creates a really nice visual pie chart for you to look at to see where your money is going. Um, for me, that's really helpful. I'm a very much a visual learner, so staring at numbers, despite you know, working in a financial aid office for as long as I have, not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> um, however, that graph, really, really easy to peek at really quickly, right? Um, and the whole idea behind this is being able to physically see the results of your actions. That's why knowing your income and expenses is important on the behavioral side of things. To do this, you just want to define a period to evaluate. Again, this tool does a month. Um, however, it doesn't have to be a month. If you tend to handle your finances on a bi-weekly pay scale, and that's easier for you, go for it. Um, if you're looking to do that based on a semester-based system, because maybe we're receiving student aid that we only get in the beginning of the semester, you can use that too. Whatever you decide to do, though, you want it to be indicative of your circumstances. So if that's not, um, so if that semester uh, example is not really great for you, because that's not what you do, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, at the other side of it, you also want to make sure that you're thinking about all of your expenses and any atypical spending that may happen during that period, right? Uh, so let's say, you know, you get um, a gift around the holidays. That might potentially be a great example. Um, ultimately, if it's a it's a decent sized gift, it could make your budget or that evaluation period look a little strange, right? You don't have that coming in all the time. Um, tax time is another good example of this, right? Some of us owe money at tax time. Some of us actually wind up getting a refund at tax time. Either way, it's not typical. It's something that happens once a year. So you want to be mindful of that as you're going through this process. And then very simply, you're going to track your income versus expenses, right? If you get paid on day one of the month, you go ahead and put that into the, the field, right? On whatever system you decide to use. On day two, you buy coffee, you go ahead and put the money that you spent on your coffee. If your bills come due for your utilities on day three, and so on and so on and so on. And then after doing that, that's when you ultimately see the information you're seeing here for this particular tool. At that point, Having this nice representation of things in front of you, you can go ahead and evaluate what happened, right? Did you meet all of your needs? And then maybe why we didn't meet all of our needs, if that was the case, or if there's a huge surplus of money that we just have extra, what could we potentially do with it? What happened? Was something not typical this period? What ultimately changed? Um, and what can we do with those extra resources? But whatever it is, um, any tool that you utilize and any process you utilize, you want it to be flexible. Um, the reason for that, again, we all shift our priorities and a little bit of our identity every once in a while as we change over time. So you need something that's going to work with you as you continue to do that. And this, this tool here is a really fantastic tool for that process. Now, if we go through and we see the type of income and expenses that we have left over, right, we can then think about all those things that we want, don't necessarily need, and start to treat them as if they were goals, right, goals that we can plan for. There's a few different ways you can choose to do this. A lot of us have kind of set up established goal setting methods that work for us, right, especially as students, we know how we need to achieve things in a certain time period in the way that we work. Uh, if that's something you struggle with, I certainly do. Um, there's a couple tips that we can share, right? So one way of doing it is kind of the funnel effect. Take your goal, write it down, and then start tracking the steps backwards to figure out exactly what you need to do to achieve it. Um, and what systems you might put in place to make that happen, right? Goals don't happen by themselves. We need to set up tangible action to be able to achieve them. 
Um, one of the ways you can potentially do that is using the SMART goal method, um, which if you've heard of it, awesome. If not, uh, welcome to it. Uh, we see this a lot in the business context, right? Um, the idea here is it's an acronym standing for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time-based, all being critical things to setting a goal, right? Your goal needs to be specific because you can't determine what you need to do if you don't have all the details. Going on vacation is one thing. Going on vacation at, in Hawaii with your parents in three years is another. That's something we can plan for. We know when that's going to happen. We know where we're going. We know what to look for. Uh, measurable on that side, right? Um, that means you can track your progress. Make sure that you're actually making it towards your goal. If you don't have a way to measure progress, you'll never actually know if you're on track to achieve it. Attainable, right? You want to make sure it's something that's reasonable for you to actually do. Um, if you set a goal, let's say to go on vacation and you ultimately see it's going to cost you about $5,000 to go and you're planning on going in a year and that's just not in your budget, that's not the right goal. You have no way to actually make that goal happen. So you want to make sure you're thinking reasonably. And you want your goal to be relevant. And that one is really interesting to me because whenever we think about goal setting, we assume, right, intrinsically, it's probably because we want to achieve something. It's not always the case, right? There's a lot of influences outside of us. So something that might be relevant to your family could wind up on your goal list because you want to be um, in a position where you're making them happy. Same thing with our assignments at school or potentially an employer. Um, when we're talking about that finance conversation, you want to make sure for sure that it's relevant to you because otherwise you're not likely to pursue it with a real sense of authenticity. And then lastly, time-based. A goal without an end date is a goal that's been pushed off, right? If we don't tell ourselves we're going to commit to achieving something, one, we won't have a way to measure it. We need to know exactly when we're supposed to achieve it. And two, it gets down prioritized, right? It's not important enough for us to give a date to. Maybe it's not important enough for us to actually achieve. So having that date is really important. And some of what will tell you what that date is, is the evaluations that you're doing in this process, right? Um, whether it'll be a short-term goal, which are usually really small expenses, um, intermediate, which is about six months to a year, and then long-term goals, which would be anything that's greater than a year. A really great example there would be retirement planning, right? Retirement planning, even though we know it's something we have to do, we don't always think of in the context of long-term goals. It absolutely is. And it's a good example because it's specific. We know when it's supposed to be something we achieve, right? We know when we're hoping to retire. And then we can actually, it's relevant to us and we know we ha it has to be attainable. We've got to be able to get there. And by setting up those steps, we can then measure our progress and adjust as need be. Then we're going to talk about making a spending plan, right? Moving it into the future. So your spending plan is a hybrid between your budget, what you already know, and your goals, where you're hoping your money can go to achieve them, right? Uh, the best thing to do to do this is to estimate projected expenses and income with as much information as you can. You want them to be as accurate as possible. Um, otherwise, it's not necessarily going to be helpful. <laughs> Um, with that being said, there's a few resources here on the screen that you can utilize to do that. One, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has information about occupational earnings. So if you're looking to kind of get a better idea as to what your income might look like after school, you can use that. Or the Consumer Price Index has information related to kind of a percentage-based change on common expenses, right? It's not dollar for dollar, but rather if you looked at it over a period of six months, you could see if something was trending in a certain direction and whether or not you expect it might increase in cost over time. Um, Move.org kind of has the more dollar for dollar information on utilities, um, and they do that by state as well as uh, nationally. And iGrad has more calculators than I can honestly count off the top of my head that can help you better understand the value of your investments and savings. Um, and we're actually going to go through a couple of those today with examples. Um, there's also information here about employer payment benefits, and in the event that you may qualify for some type of forgiveness program, there's information listed here as far as student loans go. Of course, student loans, you have to anticipate repaying them because if you borrow them, that's the expectation. But there is information for those students that may be able to utilize a plan like that. And then go through the process of actually developing your spending plan. Think about your goals. What ones do you want to achieve first? Look at your resources and ultimately decide what can go where. Now, there's a lot of different platforms to help do that, but before we get to that point, I wanted to share another course that's available in iGrad, and this actually has a little bit more information related to um, what's occurring in the course, right? So this one's creating a financial plan for your priorities and goals. That's exactly what we're doing today. So you'll see a lot of similar information in this course. Um, each course is set up so that there's an outside shell that provides information about the course, as well as that brief course overview, letting you know the level of the course. They have three levels, kind of a beginner, intermediate, and advanced. 
Um, and they also, if you're the type of person that's not going to read a whole paragraph, have bullet points <laughs> on what you're actually going to achieve in this course. It starts off with a pre-assessment. Um, you're seeing some of those questions in the middle of the screen. Uh, they do use those beautiful smiley faces, um, which I think is fantastic. But you'll see a lot of it starts off just with how you feel about certain things, because your own feeling on something is very likely accurate about your understanding. Uh, but to that end, they'll ask about financial priorities and really just general questions. And as you go through the course, you'll be able to see kind of a direct outline as to what happens within it, right? Um, just introducing information, they'll have different videos, they'll give little quizzes on the way through to see if you're gaining knowledge as you're going through this process, right? Um, and you get a little certificate when you're done. Um, there's courses that are about 15 minutes and there's courses that are closer to 45. So you can also see the length of time it might need to get there. But if you're looking to try and set up a goal and you're not really sure how to plan for it, this course is a great opportunity to review because uh, it has a lot of fundamental information in there for that. Again, we have a couple of different tools to help us with this budgeting process, right? Um, what you're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen are two of the common ones, uh, three, uh, three of the common ones. I told you I was bad <laughs> numbers. <laughs> Um, but with that said, the three common on this side, um, the first is fintech, right? Those app-based systems that are available to us. And, you know, we can't recommend one or the other, but my usual suggestion to students is try a couple out. First, make sure you trust where they're coming from, right? We always want to make sure what we use is safe. But two, they all do things a little bit differently, right? One of the things that you'll find as you're going through this process is sometimes the tool is just not the right one. I had tried myself using like an app-based system. Um, and unfortunately, for the type of person that I am, my phone goes off a lot. So if I have something notifying me as a reminder, I'm likely just to push it aside. It's not going to be something that's helpful for me. So I had to sit down and think about a way that works and I need to actually schedule time and go through my budget and review it every once in a while and be deliberate about it. Um, there's also, of course, programs you can utilize, like the Excel spreadsheet we just looked at. Um, there's all, also different software programs out there. And if you're the type of person that has a hard time kind of seeing your money when it's not right in front of you, um, you know, credit cards, for example, are good. Uh, are something that can occur with as well as student loans. You don't have to physically see the money exchange hands, so it's hard to feel it. Um, there's this idea of using the back of the envelope method. And that's literally just having an envelope for each category in your budget, putting the amount of money that's set for it, flipping it over and writing the category on the back. And that's what you have for the period of time that you're looking to utilize it for in your budget. Um, again, you never want to carry around large amounts of cash, so that might not be the safest thing to do on that, you know, on the practical side, but if you're the type of person that needs to see the money either going up or down over a period, that can be a really helpful way to visualize it. Now, the one that was on the big picture on that last screen is what we're talking about here. This is iGrads Your Budget Tool. So they have that Excel version we looked at before. This one's actually available to you within the platform, right? It's a more dynamic tool. And it starts off just, again, with some of the same categories that we have on that other spreadsheet we looked at. You put the information in relating to your income and your expenses over bucket categories. Um, but it has those more dynamic tools than the spreadsheet, right? Um, what you're seeing towards the middle of the screen is a tab on the right-hand side of the budget information that allows you to kind of make adjustments to some of this information just using a slider that you're seeing at the bottom of that image. Um, what it does is it lets you see if you can reduce expenses by a certain percentage, what it would do for your budget, right? And that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen adjacent to it. It's showing this person if they wanted to reduce by 13%, they'd ultimately see these costs that are highlighted in blue. So that can be a really helpful tool in just understanding how much money is going where, um, as well as having those dynamic tools to help you make decisions for what's reasonable and what's not. It also gives you the chance to kind of put your savings goals all in one place. That's the top right corner of your screen that you're seeing there. So rather than having kind of separate tracking mechanisms for a lot of different things, you can track your individual saving goals here as well. And it'll let you know if you're on track. You put your deadline in, you put the amount, um, you put the current balance that you have, and it lets you know what you would need to do to be able to achieve that goal. It's fantastic. And then the last step, right? Sticking to it arguably the hardest step, right? A lot of the time we set up these budgets, we go through the effort of putting everything into place, we think about our goals, 
And then we actually have to keep that promise to ourselves, right? We wrote it down. We said we're going to do it. Now we have to execute. This is the action part, right? Um, and largely that action has to be cyclical, right? We don't want to just put it in practice, but we have to evaluate in order to understand if we're actually achieving those goals. Did we do well, right? If we didn't do well, where did we struggle and why? Where did we do really well? And what can we apply from that one area to another where we may have had trouble? Were we reasonable in setting our goals? That's a big one. That's why we focus on those SMART goals as a way to kind of work through that process because you know it's important to make sure you can actually achieve what's there. And do you have to make changes or can you make changes, right? That's a good question. Let's say if you find that you have surplus funds, right? I didn't necessarily have to change anything, but is my money doing as much as it could be for me? That's where you can make changes. Ultimately, by doing this, what you're effectively giving yourself the opportunity to do is have more control. You'll understand those things that might potentially set you off track. Um, so that's what they mean when we talk about stimuli. I know for me, I'm a bit of a coffee drinker and a Dunkin' Donuts shop is a very hard place not to go to for me. And there are far too many on my commute into the campus <laughs> uh, to, to really handle as somebody who's a little impulsive. So I found that um, you go going through my budget, how much money I was spending on coffee and decided I can't do this anymore. That's not reasonable for me. I have coffee at home. And one transport mug is a lot less expensive than having to buy a new coffee coffee every day. It saves me time and it saves me money. So it's well worth doing for me. And that gives me that sense of control, right? I now made a decision, which gives me control. I can control how I respond to a circumstance. It looks a little funny if you're drinking a coffee and walk into a coffee shop. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and that ultimately helps you control the consequences and your money over time. But of course, there's no such thing as failure in this process, right? It's a self-reflective process and you have to be flexible and kind to yourself as you do it. Um, the last thing you wanna do is set yourself up to have an experience where you feel like you failed because anytime we feel like we fail, we're discouraged to keep trying um, and failure isn't an option here. Our finances are important. But why is it so hard to stick to these plans? <laughs> you know, we tell ourselves we want to do it. Why can't we? Um, this is actually a snapshot of the theoretical model of change. And we see this a lot when we talk about behavior in the health industry, um, but it applies really to any behavior that we look at evaluating. Um, if we're looking to make some type of change, right, which ultimately we may have to do when we put our budgets and spending plans together, it's a lot better, um, it's a lot more likely, excuse me, that we'll achieve that goal and be successful at it if we consider two different things. One, are we ready to actually make some changes, right? It's one thing to put it down on paper, but are we really looking to do that? Um, one of the pieces of this model, you'll see they have pre-contemplation and contemplation. Those are kind of your starter sections in the model. People in pre-contemplation are really just not thinking about making changes. They're not ready to make changes. They don't necessarily think they have to make changes. That's just existence as existence. Where contemplation is where the idea starts to occur. So if you're not looking to make adjustments and ultimately see that you need to, it's gonna be very hard to be successful. Um, how do we get ourselves in the right headspace then? How do we get ready to make those changes? There's a few things that we can do. One, a good system is a great way to better your likelihood of making that successful, right? Um, when we talk about systems, again, it's just the steps we need to take to do something. Oh, sorry about that. Um, when we think about those steps, uh, let's say, for example, if you we were talking about the context of weight loss here, right, we want to run a 5k, we can't just go outside and run a 5k if we've never ultimately attempted to run before, or if we're not in the habit of going for a walk every day, you're not going to be successful. So what do we need to do? Well, for me, I need to think about how I can motivate myself to do that and eliminate obstacles, right? I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I've got clothes ready to go in the morning. I'm going to make sure that the water is already set to go and in the fridge. Um, I'm going to make it so that, you know, if I have to pick up my mask to go outside for any reason, that's hanging next to my keys as I walk out the door. I don't want to have to go back into the house. It's setting up those things that will ultimately make you successful. And then how much am I going to do on any given day? I'm going to run 10 minutes. Am I going to start with walking? All of that is going to play into your capability for success. And it has to be deliberate for that reason. Um, it's not something that anybody can expressly tell you how to do for yourself because we're all so different. Um, so sit down and think about what will ultimately make you successful. And if you're ready to make those changes. Now, I don't see that we've had any questions come through the chat. So in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going, but I do encourage you, please ask. I'm really good at monitoring it as we go. If you see my eyes kind of shoot to the side, that's why, because I'm checking to make sure that we have no questions or if I can answer anything. But for now, we're going to press forward. 
So now we're going to get to the crux of this session, right? Oh, I do see we had somebody raise their hand, though. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, so I actually struggle a lot with impulse um, spending. I could go like a dry period of like three months and then stress hits from grad school and then I go to the, to the mall and spend like $500. So what resources or advice do you have for impulse spending? Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, first, you're not alone. That It's like reading out of my own diary. <laughs> Uh, so don't feel like you're alone. Um, but usually what I recommend is think about what is making you impulsive, right? Especially if you're going through periods where there's dry spells and then um, big differences for a period of time. A lot of that can be offset by something circumstantial. I know for me in the winter, um, I get a little bit, you know, I'm not as happy as I am over the summer, right? And that's not uncommon. So I tend to try and fulfill myself with something. And a lot of the time that's making purchases. So if you can think about what ultimately is kind of putting you to a position of impulse, right? Um, then you can have a better idea as to what you can then do to stop those impulses uh, or not even stop them because it's hard to do that, right? Rather than stop them, mitigate them. What can we do to make ourselves feel better in a different way? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you so much for sharing it. Now from here, Let's again go ahead and put this into the context of what we're doing with our winter break budgeting, right? Um, there's a couple considerations that we have as we think about our five steps to effective budgeting. We need to know what resources we have for the break and what we're ultimately able to prioritize and where. Um, from there, we also have um, identifying what you need to do uh, over the break, um, what you want to do over the break, what you're expected to do over the break, uh, and plan for those things that you will pursue. Um, that's really important, right? Um, when we think about winter break, there's often holidays involved in that. Um, and even if there's not, we're often going home to family that we haven't seen in a little while, if we're not local necessarily. Um, it's also just a stressful time in general, right? Uh, so we need to be prepared to ultimately mitigate what we actually do. We don't want to necessarily commit to everything because we can blow budgets that way and we can create extra stress. And that's certainly a way to do um, to put yourself at risk as well. I saw we had a comment come through as well. Uh, keep separate accounts for different purposes. Bills, no guilt spending, deposit a set amount for each. That's a really great um, tip. That's a great tip. So that's a lot like the idea of that on um, back of the envelope method, but it's using the electronic me mechanisms that are available or the retail banking system that's available as well. I um, mean, kind of along the same line, if you're the type of person that has a hard time doing that, um, let's say saving, for example, um, I purposefully set up my savings account uh, in a um, an online bank that doesn't have retail locations and that that debit card stays home. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, and if I need to use it, it's a lot more difficult to physically get money out of there. <laughs> So that's a little bit of a deterrent for me as well. But with that being said, um, some of the other things we want to consider, right? We want to make sure that we think about our finances just as we have um, throughout this uh, session so far. And there's two different facets that we really want to think about that through. We want to look at the past information that's available to us, right? Because that's kind of our historic spending and in information. And then we need to see if the plans that we have can be met through our expenses. And if not, what we can adjust. So we're going to go through an example of that here. So these are a couple of questions that we'll have to answer, right? Are we staying on campus or near campus? Are we traveling? Um, are we going on vacation or doing something else? Um, and from there, the considerations that go with each of those, travel and associated costs, uh, the personal resources that we have, those expectations and obligations I chatted with you about, and relationship dynamics and emotions, right? Holidays being stressful, our families can be stressful sometimes, and we don't want to let that get to us, not at a time where we're supposed to be having a really great opportunity to see our families while we're working so hard at school. So if we're going to use an example for our student, Isabella, right? She is from Jacksonville, Florida, and she plans to return to visit her family there over the winter break. Um, she's going to be there for about a week, um, and they actually are going to be hosting her parents a white elephant gift exchange, which if you're not familiar with it, it's just the basic concept of kind of grabbing a gift and first person gets to hold on to their second person, person that goes ultimately can steal from the first person, um, or they can keep the unwrapped gift that's in their hand. And that goes on through the number of people that are there. Uh, so it's just kind of a way to swap gifts throughout the period and make it a bit of a game, right? Um, she also plans to visit um, and exchange gifts with uh, her, her brother who's married, but they don't have kids. Um, she's going to be doing that as well with her sister, uh, who has two primary school aged kids, you know, like seven, nine around there. I mean, her two best friends from high school, right? That's something very common we do when we go home. We go see the people we haven't seen in forever. We get back to our roots. 
Uh, they also plan to go to dinner um, with her friends to exchange gifts. And then she also plans to spend an overnight trip with friends to celebrate New Year's Eve. So this is her docket for the time that she's gonna be away over the break. Ultimately, this is her budget, right? This is the same tool we were talking about before. Um, if we look at it, there's a couple of areas that really make a lot of sense. We see housing costs, that makes sense. Utilities look reasonable. Uh, there's nothing really jumping out on that end that looks a little strange. Um, if we keep going, we can see that she has some personal family expenses in an other category as well as a giving category. So that's an area we wanna get some clarification on and understand. Um, and then some of the other expenses that are listed here, there's a dining and going out option, right? And that's at 135. We don't really know what that is, if it's standard or if there was something unusual um, and clothes, same idea. We also have auto insurance on here, but I don't see any other car related expenses. So I wanna get a little bit more information about that too, right? And of course, the last little bit, we can kind of see savings and debt information. Now, um, with that being said, for credit card, she does have a $50 credit card payment. So she's making that particular expense and she's making that payment. It's important to consider. Um, but also from there, she's doing a great job of saving in her emergency fund because that's important to have. And she's also planning for a vacation. But beyond that, there's some really interesting things in these other categories that we don't know what they are. Uh, we can see going through this that she has a surplus at the end of the month, $288. Um, and we want to see if she's going to meet her needs using the information that's available to us. These are the ones that I personally have questions on, right? We talked about the ones that make a lot of sense, but I want to clarify what some of these other areas are, explicitly the other section, right? Now, as we go through this, uh, we find out that um, for groceries and toiletries and utilities that Isabella spends about $250 a month on those particular things. And she got that number from evaluating her prior budgets and spending um, and the information available in that context. Now, the 135 uh, that she's listed in the dining and going out category, that's ultimately representing that gift exchange with her friends that she's going to be doing um, and the overnight stay for New Year's, right? So that's how much she's allocating to that at this moment. Clothes, um, she had gotten ready to, for this trip and saw that she did not have what she needed in order to be comfortable in Florida. It's a little cold here in New York right now, right? <laughs> uh, we might not all have shorts readily available. So after looking at her own, um, you know, her own summer clothing, she needed to buy a few things. Uh, and giving, she ultimately has been contributing to a local um, animal shelter nearby her parents' home. Um, and that's something that's important to her. And she likes being able to do that around the holidays every year. Now the auto insurance, we find out that Isabella does currently have a car, but it's at her parents' home and they keep it for her. There's no debt associated with the car and it's in relatively good shape with low mileage, but it's her first car um, and approaching 15 years old. I don't know if anybody else lived that life, but my first car was definitely a character piece, <laughs> the way I like to think of it. Um, the other section that we have, right, $50 of that, uh, we find out that she's purchased a few new electronics and charging cables for her laptop and phone, typical usage type of things. Um, the 127, anybody recognize the number? It's a monthly transit pass. A lot of us know what that is. <laughs> so that's kind of in this other category listed there. And she has about $40 in monthly streaming services that's also listed there too. Now, the emergency fund, she started putting that money away very recently, um, and she hopes to amass about $3,000 by the end of the fall 22 semester. Um, this way, she has some padding in the event she needs it. Um, and that vacation that she's planning for, it looks like it's really important to her. It's something that she's gifting to herself after she graduates her program, kind of a, a yay, we made it type of experience. Now, when we look at her gifting needs, right, we didn't talk about that yet. Isabella has a total of 10 gifts that she needs to buy, and she usually spends $50 or so on each person, okay? Um, however, the gift exchange is an exception. It's about $25 is the limit that goes there. Um, and she also likes to put a little more money towards the kids in her life, so her niece and nephew, okay? She finds that um, she is going to be staying at a beach house with her friends, so there's not a lot of expense associated for that for the New Year's Eve session, but she's put what she needs into the same bucket as the going out um, 135 that was listed there. And then she goes to figure out airfare. Um, she goes to price it uh, between 1224 and 1E, and she finds that the cheapest she can find for a round trip nonstop is $350 before taxes and fees but it's the lowest that she could find at her preferred date of travel, as well as her preferred airport. And if we add these extra expenses that she has for this trip into her budget, she's 
she's not going to make it. Um, she is short by $587. So there's some work to do here, right? This is what evaluating your needs is going to look like. And now we can then reflect and see where we can make changes. Where can we adjust, right? Um, for travel, uh, there's the opportunity to look at a couple of different transit passes, right? We're not going to be gone for the whole month, but we are going to be gone for a good portion of it. Um, and she does some calculation to figure out if she has 16 days, she would typically be traveling in December. That comes to about $88 or so. Uh, same concept for January, $93.50. Um, based on using a couple of weekly passes, as well as a few day passes here and there, um, based on her typical travel needs as well. And as she compares them, she sees that her costs, if she does it that way, is $115.50 versus the $381 for two monthly passes that she would usually pay. So that's one area where she may be able to make a big change. Um, the groceries, toiletries, and utilities, same concept. She took the total and just divided it out to get a number per day. And now we have how much it should ultimately cost. We can then account for that in our budget and reduce the overall cost. But we haven't talked about those value-based considerations yet, right? The vacation, we know that that's important to her, her emergency fund, and the charitable donation. And that's what we'll chat through next. Um, ultimately, we talked a little bit about this, right? Um, Isabella calculated those monthly expenses for her travel and found a way to make that a reduced cost. Um, she also, knowing that airfare was largely um, the, the big expense on this trip, right? That was a good chunk of it. Um, she looked for an alternative way to get home. Unfortunately, she had a friend that was going to be kind of traveling to the same area, close enough that her parents were comfortable picking her up for um, from that trip. So with that being said, she's able to drive and ultimately get home that way at a much cheaper cost. That person's only asking them to chip in for gas and mileage, and they ask for $65 from everybody, and there's going to be four people in the car. Um, so that is going to be a lot less expensive, partly because she was able to get a one-way trip on the way back for $99. So that significantly reduces that overall expense. And then, of course, she goes through and calculates the amount for those utilities um, and groceries and reduces accordingly. Now, the value-based side. Isabella determines that she's not willing to compromise her emergency saving, which she probably shouldn't, or her vacation fund. It's too important to her. But she's going to reduce her donation amount. It's still important, so she decides to volunteer some of her time while she's there, rather than just give them money. And that's one way you can potentially reduce some expenses. Um, she ultimately also has a chance to connect with her friends and they decide to forgo gifts. They're going to be at both the parties that she's doing over the holidays. And they said, you know what, we're friends. We can exchange through that process instead. Um, they'll have a potluck afterwards so they can still get together and have that nice intimate experience of connecting before everybody goes back to school. Um, the other thing that Isabella ultimately decides is she's been in school, she went to her undergraduate program away from home, and she immediately went to graduate school away from home. This car has been sitting there for her for a very long time in her parents' garage. Does she need it? She decides she doesn't. She doesn't think she's going to be living in an area where a car is still going to make sense after she leaves. She'd like to stay in an urban area like New York. So she asks if her parents can help her sell it for about $1,500 based on what she thinks the value is and doing some research what that did for her, right? Um, ultimately, we up the amount of money that's available to her um, significantly. Uh, she has additional money from that car sale, and that ultimately left us with a lot more money to play with at the end of the month without actually having to adjust anything on the amount we're spending in gifts, right? She didn't want to compromise that, and they were relatively fair amounts in her mind. So in going through the math, this now creates a net surplus of $1,696.50. So she has not just enough money to go through her expenditure, but she has extra in, 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 in to use in different ways, right? How she can put it to use um, and what will be the best benefit to her. Well, I don't see that we have any more questions come in. And just because we're approaching the end of the session, I want to make sure we get through everything. Um, from here, how do we ultimately do this for ourselves, right? Isabella has her own unique circumstance. Um, we all have our own unique circumstances as well, right? So what are some tips for ultimately getting home a little less expensively as far as travel is concerned? Try and book your flight as early as possible. The more time you give yourself, uh, the likelihood you'll see a little bit lower a price. 
Um, you want to try and avoid peak travel days and use flexible travel dates. Sometimes a Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Tuesday or Saturday, they could have different prices for the same flight. So if you're not terribly specific on the day you're traveling, that could be helpful for you. Um, same idea with red eye flights. Those are those really, really early flights, those really, really late flights. Those are often less attended and less utilized, so they can be a little less expensive. And of course, pack light. If you have to bring a bunch of stuff with you on a trip, like gifts, for example, it can get really expensive if you have to check a bag and check a bag and check a bag. Um, you could certainly look at shipping costs, for example, um, ship your gifts over to your family as opposed to bringing them on at that expense. Uh, as far as looking at travel opportunities, especially with airfare, try and do that in a private browser, whether that's incognito for Google um, or another privacy-based one, because those, those cookies that we have in our browsers, um, whenever we go to those types of sites, it remembers that we had been there and you may not get the same benefit you would as if it was the first time you were looking. And lastly, relax. We can all get a little amped up as we're trying to go through the process of scheduling some of these things. And that just adds to kind of the chaos of it. And when we get stressed, we get impulsive. And when we get impulsive, we don't necessarily stick to our plans. So you want to make sure you're taking a breath as you do this. For the holiday expenses, um, shop with a list, so important, right? You want to know what you're looking for before you go, know how much you're going to spend on it, like the budget. Um, and ultimately, having that list means you're less likely to deter and have an impulse buy, right? Um, keep your receipts so that you can evaluate from year to year and think about your spending habits. Again, if you're the type of person that having a credit card or a debit card and not seeing the money go back and forth is a difficult experience for you, maybe shopping with cash might not be a bad idea as long as it's not an overwhelming amount to keep on your person. Uh, another great one is to give experiences instead of gifts, right? I love this. Um, you can certainly look to volunteer, for example, with a bunch of friends. That's one option that you have. Um, or if you just decide to ultimately go somewhere together, that's low cost. We're ultimately talking about periods of time where we're looking to reconnect with people, not buy them things. So think about what that could mean for you. And then when you do have to buy, look at ways to consolidate, right? Um, if you can give groups as a gift, whether they're families or couples, and then utilize any deals or coupons that might be available to you through memberships, things like that. Of course, Black Friday, if you're the type of person to shop there, Cyber Monday could be a benefit to you. And again, consider sharing your time rather than money. They want to see you, not your presence. We can save and earn, right? Um, organize your volunteering versus holiday parties. We talked about that just a second ago. I like this one, do your winter cleaning. Um, and when we talk about winter cleaning, oh, and this is exactly where I'm going um, as far as the secondhand comment goes. That's perfect. Uh, so winter cleaning is kind of the other side of that conversation. Um, one, if you buy secondhand, you're absolutely right. It's far less expensive usually, and it's often a lot more sustainable because you're not looking at all those really big supply chain kind of uh, demands on the system. Uh, on the other side of it, you can also sell things that way, right? There's no reason as you're going through your closet that you can't look to put good items that are not in bad wear into a, uh, a consignment shop and see if they'll be able to give you some money for it. You can also look to learn a new skill. This isn't something that necessarily is gonna give you a direct impact right away, but anytime we learn new skills, maybe taking some courses in iGrad, who knows? Um, we're ultimately giving ourselves an edge professionally, right? It's the same idea with updating your resume. Um, especially if you might want to look for maybe a short-term internship. There are sometimes opportunities where you can do that while you're away, and that could potentially be a source of income. Or if you're going to be home, let's. a lot of people do travel around this time of year, so maybe you'll be able to pick up some extra hours or a seasonal job. I've had mine. Um, I was an elf, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but having that extra income in conjunction with other things was really helpful around that time of year. Beyond that, limit stress. You don't want to be looking to have stress because, again, it makes you a little impulsive. And the same idea with boredom. When we're bored, we ultimately look to find something to do, whether it's, you know, just kind of out and shopping or sometimes we might pick arguments with family. That happens, right? Um, ultimately, if you can find a way not to be bored, you're going to have a better time. Now, these are some of the things that are available to help support your needs through iGrad. What you're looking at uh, beyond a lot of information <laughs> um, is their topics hubs, right? Um, they have one general topic hub, uh, which lets you go ahead and take a look for information on several different topics in several different ways. Uh, and if you go and choose one individual topic and you do that through that um, top header on the screen, you can choose different content areas, whether it be budgeting or whether it be credit, whatever it happens to be. And from there, you'll see the latest information that they have. They have what's popular under that section. And then you can search through all of the related content. Now, if you're on that main topic hub, 
you can select the button that says see more topics and it gives you a list of about 30 to 40 different categories that you can expand on. Um, my favorite, if we're looking at that list towards the middle of the screen, uh, is behavioral finance, the why of your finances. So if that's not an area you're familiar with and want to understand, you've got resources to you right there. And one of the most valuable things in these sections are their start here guides. Um, the start here guides that are available in the individual topic hubs are related to the topic you're looking at. So on the left hand side, uh, this one included stuff about going financially green um, and how to prepare for a move and minimizing fees. So it very likely has to do with saving, right? Things that you might have to pay for. iGrad also has a really fantastic scholarship search engine. Um, what this is, is if we're ultimately looking to reduce costs at any period, right, especially as a student, you have the capability to log into iGrad and search in one place for a plethora of different scholarship opportunities. You can open up each scholarship, look at the individual opportunity, uh, it lets you sort it and filter it among several different ways. Uh, for example, if you're a, an international student, you can indicate that um, so that you're only getting the opportunities that make sense for you. You can filter by grade level, and then it actually gives you the information when you click on each one right there. It doesn't have to take Take you to another site to do that so you can see if it's worth doing before you have to travel to another website. I would highly recommend if the only reason you create an account, at least do it for this. It's worth looking. Now we're going to go back to Isabella for a second, right? Um, Isabella, right, we knew that she had this $3,000 goal for her emergency saving plan, and that's on the left hand side of the screen. This is one of the tools that's available in iGrad you can utilize to see if we're getting close to what we need to do. It's their savings growth tool, and it lets you understand the value of a deposit. Um, she had her money in a traditional savings account, and based on the amount of time that year or so that she was looking to accomplish her goal in, she can make it based on what she's doing. There's that $250 she's contributing, even starting at zero. She is going to make it to her goal. Now, the other goal, that vacation, is another story, right? With the amount she was looking to contribute, $200 a month in that same year, she cannot get there. It's just not possible, right? So she has to adjust in order to make that happen. In doing that, there's another tool we can utilize, right? Um, first and foremost, sticking with our savings growth tool, we see that if she takes that surplus amount that she had on um, less the $598, right? Or the, the 288 rather, that she had um, kind of in surplus previous to making those adjustments and uses 500 or so of that in her initial deposit amount for that account, she can then make her goal, right? This can help her decide what she should do with that extra surplus of money. However, we do know she had a credit card payment, right? And iGrad has a credit card pay down tool to help you better understand some of the ways that you might potentially reduce your debts. Um, for this one, her credit card's $1,500 and she's only been making the minimum payment of $50 a month. And according to this, it'll take her more than 30 years to accomplish paying that off based on the way that interest accrues. So how does she now prioritize this money? What's the better option here? Are we earning more interest than we are having to pay more interest? Probably not. And we can see that here, okay, if we adjust this, right, and take the, um, take a portion of that money and put it into uh, this, this particular debt, right, make a big payment towards the principal. What that did for her is it reduced her minimum payment to $33, right, and it also made it that she could achieve this goal in five years and six months. That's hugely significant, right? And because we ultimately saw that minimum payment go down, as long as she's still comfortable with the $50 a month she was paying before, it could be even faster. This is just assuming she pays the 33. If she keeps paying 50, she has more money going towards that principal balance. So this is one of the ways that you can use some of those tools in iGrad to kind of have that direct correlation to how to make decisions. So I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, for me, I say this to all of my students, um, evaluating and adhering to your spending plan reinforces your capability to succeed and provides a factual foundation for making positive long lasting changes. It's so important to go through and evaluate. You'll never know the wins that you're achieving if you don't look at it, right? Um, that goes for anything, your spending plan. That's the same for your goals. If you review them and adjust as necessary, um, it's the same thing with growing your financial knowledge, your Finlet toolkit, and then acting with intention, right? That ultimately shows you can continue to do that. 
And all of that really turns into just how much your commitment to invest in you reinforces your capability to succeed and provide that factual foundation for making positive, long-lasting changes. So we can look at this, uh, this winter break as an opportunity to practice, right? Going through the process and getting used to it. Because when we get back, a lot of the time changes are very easily made or more easily made when we do them on, uh, on a Monday or let's say New Year's Day, something that we know we're planning a target for, right? Gives us the time to prep for it instead of deciding today we're going to change something and put those tools in place. Um, so this is meant to really give you the best chance for success and to see why telling yourself that you can do it and realizing you've done it is so important. Beyond that, the remaining slides here are just information on creating your iGrad account and creating um, using the platform, as well as information related to the pandemic and resources on where you can find the most current information, both as a student loan borrower, if that's the case for you, uh, through the university um, and other resources. Uh, but for me, that's the last bit that I had to chat through today. Um, I'd like to open the floor to any other questions that may be uh, hanging out for anybody. But if not, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to uh, Antonia to wrap us up. 